Welcome to Emmanuel and welcome to worship. We are in the fourth week of the discipleship journey and I hope that you're following along in your book at home with your family or getting together with a small group. This week, just for reference, you should refer to session four, Bible study and devotions. But before we begin today, I have an important question for you. Would you trust this money? <laughs> Probably not, because you can see, well, it's counterfeit. Well, yeah, it resembles an authentic $100 bill, but you can clearly see it's a fake. Nice picture, though, don't you think? <laughs> well, there's a lot of people today who trust what we might call counterfeit Christianity. So today we're going to help you discern between what is real and what is fake. So you can be absolutely sure you are on the right path to heaven and you can lead others there as well. the king of my heart be the mountain where I run the fountain I drink from oh he is my song let the king of my heart be the shadow where I hide the ransom for my life oh he is my song you are In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Jesus Christ was in the world, and the world was made through him. 
yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. God has come to us to make us his own children. Let us then confess our sins of unbelief, that he may give us faith to receive him and his love. O God, we confess that we have ignored your voice and spirit by choosing to go our own way. Without you, we are lost and confused and without hope. Without you, we do not know love. Come now to us and forgive our waywardness and weakness. Give us your gifts of faith, hope, and love. Receive us again into the family of your redeemed. Amen. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory. Glory is of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. In the stead and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all your sins, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. My dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry, because human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. Therefore get rid of all moral filth and the evil that is so prevalent, and humbly accept the word planted in you, which can save you. Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like someone who looks at his face in a mirror, and after looking at himself, goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. But whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues in it, not forgetting what they have heard but doing it, they will be blessed in what they do. Those who consider themselves religious and yet do not keep a tight rein on their tongues deceive themselves, and their religion is worthless. Religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless as this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress, and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. Hello and good morning, my beautiful Emmanuel families. I'm so glad you could join me here today. Today, I want to talk about making decisions and how to know when I'm actually hearing God's voice telling me what to do. Now, if I were in a book, a TV, a movie, maybe a graphic novel, these guys would pop up on my shoulders and help tell me what to do. And I'd look at this guy and tell me to do one thing, and then I'd look at this guy and he'd tell me to do something else. And just by looking at them, I'd know what was the right choice to make. But unfortunately, in real life, I don't have those guys on my shoulders telling me what to do. So how do I know what is the right choice? How do I know what choice is God telling me what to do? Well, I have five little ways to help you decide what choice to make when you want to walk God's path. Number one, is it a smarter thought? Have you ever had one of those moments where it was like, Eureka, light bulb moment. I wish I had thought of that. Sometimes that's God telling you what to do. Sometimes he comes and he gives you an idea or he uses the strengths that you have in you to figure out what to do. How about another one? What about this one? It'll help, not hurt. When you are making the right choice, when you are doing what God wants you to do, it's going to help people, not hurt them. Number three, it brings peace. It's not just going to bring peace to the people around you or the people you have in question or the things that you are trying to do. It'll bring you inner peace. It'll make you feel good and your soul and your heart will be able to rest easy knowing that this is the right decision to make. This brings me to number four. This one's a little hard to deal with sometimes. 
it's not the easy way out. Sometimes the best way isn't the easiest way. And sometimes the easiest way isn't the best way. A lot of times the right decision is hard to do. But that's okay because that means we're learning an important lesson while we're doing it. Last but not least, and probably the easiest one to remember, it doesn't contradict Jesus. Jesus had so many lessons and so many teachings for us in the Bible. If you're doing something and you ask yourself, would Jesus have done this? And the answer is no, you probably shouldn't be doing it. And the right decision is right there in front of you. So even though we might not have these guys here telling us what to do simple and easy, there are five little things you can always ask yourself. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for giving us opportunities to learn and grow on this beautiful planet you have given us. And thank you for giving your voice to guide us as we do it. In your name we pray. Amen. I hope this was helpful for you guys. And as always, I enjoyed talking to you. See you again next time. Bye. One of America's best known theologians tells a story of how he was talking to his five-year-old son. And he asked him two questions. First of all, he said, are you sure that when you die, you will go to heaven? And the little boy said, yes, daddy, I am. He then asked him the second question. If you were to die tonight and God said to you, why should I let you into my heaven? What would you answer? His little boy didn't hesitate. He said immediately, because I'm dead. <laughs> now, believe it or not, that's exactly what most people think is necessary to get into heaven. So depending on which survey you believe, between 72% and 98% of Americans believe they will go to heaven when they die. Now, I believe that most people either don't understand what the Bible says about going to heaven, or they don't believe what the Bible says. They're like some people I heard about one time who were anxious to go overseas to be missionaries. But in order to get into this particular country, they needed their visas, and they didn't have them. They waited for months and months for their visas, and well, finally they asked a Christian family if they would pray that God would give them their visas. Now, the eight-year-old boy of this family went up to his daddy, and he said, what is it they need to get into this country? He said they, they need their visa. And the little boy said, well, why don't they just try MasterCard? <laughs> the fact is, you do have to have a visa to get into heaven. And his name is Jesus. But most people don't have this visa, and they're not going to get in. I know that sounds very intolerant. But I'm just repeating what Jesus said when he made one of the most politically incorrect statements in the history of the world. Enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many enter through it. But small is the gate and narrow the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. Jesus is saying that there are two roads you can travel in this world. One road leads to destruction and the other road leads to life. So how do you find this road to life? Jesus calls you in your baptism. And we walk this road through repentance and faith that Jesus of Nazareth is who he claims to be, God's son who saves his people from their sins. You don't have to have perfect understanding to walk this road. You don't even have to have great faith, even those a little faith will have enough to walk this road and enter the narrow gate to eternal life. What you will need is Jesus' continuous forgiveness when you stray, which you will, and his strength, for there will be danger all along the way. But still, you can walk with confidence because Jesus will be with you the entire time. He promises that he will never leave you and he will lead you along this path until you enter heaven through the narrow gate. The majority of the world will not follow this path. They'll take the easy path of life and do whatever they please. 
They'll take the road that has few rules, few restrictions, few requirements. It's the road for people who believe in anything or in nothing at all. The people that believe, well, one religion is just as valuable or just as good as another, that all roads lead to heaven. But what they will one day discover is the road they're on only leads to destruction. So that's really all you need to know. <laughs> there's a high road that leads to heaven, and there's a low road that leads to hell. The high road is narrow. The low road is broad. The high road is difficult. The low road is easy. Very few will take the high road. Most will take the low road. Oh, and one more thing. It's the job of those of us on the narrow way to heaven to lead people who are on the broad way to hell to get on the narrow way, which is the only way that leads to the right way to heaven. You see, it really is either God's way or the highway. In this instance, the highway is the die way. And so, my friends, we have a mandate to carry out a mission, to preach a message about a master who can take anybody to heaven. Now, today there's a word I want you to see in this passage, and it is this. Beware. You know, any time that the Son of God, Jesus Christ, tells you to beware, that's a code red. That's the highest security alert you can get. And so we better sound the alarm and ring the bell. Widen your eyes and perk up your ears because danger is lurking. Jesus said, Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. Now, of course, in Bible times, shepherds wore wool. Well, it was easy to come by. And so these false prophets, well, they deceive not by impersonating the sheep, but by impersonating the shepherd. Oh, they don't advertise themselves as false prophets. They're too smart for that. Like the counterfeit bill that, well, you may have seen before. <laughs> they try to pass themselves off as the real thing. So learn this about Satan. He's the captain of camouflage. He's the master of disguise. Listen to what Paul said about him in 2 Corinthians. For such are false apostles deceitful workers, transforming themselves into apostles of Christ. And no wonder, for Satan himself transforms himself into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also transform themselves into ministers of righteousness, whose end will be according to their works. So don't ever assume that just because someone is a the so-called theological scholar, that he's a Christian. Just because someone teaches in some Christian institution or has even been ordained to the ministry, it doesn't mean he's a true Christian. You see, a false prophet will speak just enough truth to camouflage his lies. No, we might use our vocabulary, but not our dictionary. And what they mean by Jesus and well, what we mean by Jesus could be two different things. What they mean by the Word of God and what we mean by the Word of God can be two different things. So that's the problem. False prophets wear sheep's clothing, but inwardly, they're ravenous wolves. So why do you think Jesus compared false prophets to wolves? Well, a little study of wolves just might explain it to you. You see, a large wolf may weigh in excess of 160 pounds and be able to jog up to 45 miles a day on one hunt. They're tireless and they're persistent. They're also incredibly strong. A wolf can bite clean through the back leg of a horse with one snap. Now, a German shepherd exerts, well, about 750 pounds per square inch of pressure with his jaws but a wolf can exert 1,500 pounds per square inch. But what is also interesting is 
Well, wolves, by and large, hunt weak prey, and they hunt mostly at night when their prey can't see them because they're blessed with enhanced vision. Their eyes literally glow in the dark, and they can see animals who cannot see them. They're not easily detected, and they love to come in under the radar. So that raises the question, <clears throat> how do you discern a false prophet? Well, Jesus says, by their fruit, you will recognize them. Do people pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Likewise, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, and a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Now, a wolf can wear sheep's clothing, but it cannot grow a sheep's coat. Neither can you put grapes on thorns, nor can you put figs on thistles. They simply just don't grow there. In the same way that you can discern the inner health of a tree by the quality of the fruit that it produces, the quality of a prophet's teaching and the extent to which it conforms to the words of Jesus himself, that will reveal whether the prophet is true or false from God or from Satan. What then is the fruit of a prophet? How do you discern if he's true or false? Well, since it's a prophet's fruit, it has to be what he prophesies. Not his outward deeds, but his teaching his message, his prophecy. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. I mean, even the devil can do miracles. Even the devil can perform miraculous wonders and signs that can and will deceive many. So not everything that we see is actually as it seems. Well, let me tell you a true story that I think illustrates the point. Now, there was an elderly lady years ago in California. She went to the grocery store to shop. <clears throat> when she walked outside, well, she found that there were four unknown males in her car. <laughs> well, this was a pretty tough old grandma. She dropped her shopping bag. She reached into her purse and pulled out a 38 Smith & Wesson. She ran right up to the door of the car, got in a policeman's pose pointing that gun at them and she screamed at the top of her voice i know how to use this gun and i'll use it if i have to now get out of this car <laughs> well these four men didn't say one word those doors popped open in a millisecond and they ran like mad before you could say scat those men were gone well the lady put her gun back in her purse she picked up her shopping bags, and then she went to bring them into the back seat of the car, and she got into the driver's seat. But there was one problem. Her key wouldn't fit the ignition. And the reason why it wouldn't fit, it's because it was not her car. <laughs> her car was identical to this car, but it was parked five spaces further down. Well, she reloaded her bags into her car, and she decided she had better drive to the police station. Well, the sergeant that she told the story to nearly collapsed in laughter when he pointed to the other end of the counter where four pale white males were reporting a carjacking by an elderly white woman. <laughs> so, bad things can happen when we jump to conclusions. Never jump to the conclusion that someone is a Christian just because they say Jesus is Lord, or just because they've been baptized, or just because they joined the church, or just because they sing in the choir or teach Sunday school, or even preach in a pulpit. Jesus said the true Christian who will enter the kingdom of heaven is the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. The real issue is obedience to the will and the word of God. Hebrews chapter 5 verse 9 makes it incredibly plain. 
And having been perfected, he, meaning Jesus, became the author of eternal salvation to all who obey him. Again, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name? What a great lesson we have today. Just because some, someone attaches the name of Jesus to his message doesn't make his message true. Just because someone seems to be a good person doesn't mean that they ought to be believed. There are many things that are preached in the name of Jesus that I am convinced have nothing to do with Jesus and with which Jesus would have nothing to do either. For example, there is the so-called name it and claim it message. That is, if you want it, you tell God, then he's got to give it to you. Some call it the, the health and wealth prosperity gospel. That it's the will of God that every Christian should be rich. Every Christian ought to have two Mercedes in his garage and a, and a Rolex on each wrist and a beachfront mansion in Hawaii. Well, I believe that would have been news to the Son of Man who had nowhere to lay his head. Then there is the feel it and heal it message. It's the other side of the health and wealth prosperity gospel. Now this says it's the will of God that every Christian be well. It is God's will that every Christian always be healed and always be healthy. Well, that would have been news to the Apostle Paul who continually was tormented by a thorn in the flesh that never left him. When these false preachers stand before God, he's going to say, I never knew you. The only one he knows is the one who does the will of the Father. And what is that? It is to preach the truth of the gospel, that there is no way to heaven except through Jesus Christ to repent of one's sins and believe that Jesus Christ is who he says he is, the Son of God, the Savior of the world. And that, my friends, is the genuine truth. And you can take that all the way to the bank. Amen. We join our voices now with all who worship God, confessing our faith using the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell, and on the third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy Christian church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. One, two, three, four. <laughs> Every day I wrestle with the voices that
Let us pray. O oh God of love, thanks and praise be to you for sending your only begotten Son into our flesh to open your kingdom by means of his love and deliverance and glory on the cross. Greater love has no one than this. Work in us now, your children, the gift of your love, that we would be enabled to endure the struggles of faith and hope and to reflect your true glory all our days. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, establish your whole church and this congregation that we would be walking and serving together in love for you and love toward one another and the world, that those who hear and see our witness may know the truth of the love of Jesus Christ. And may the fruit of our actions match the words of our lips so that they may come to the knowledge of your truth and salvation. Grant your strength and blessing to all who preach your life giving word and those who serve as your loving hands to all who are in any need. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Grant your grace and wisdom to all who serve in the government of our country. Give strength and integrity to those in the armed forces and to all who serve and protect us in our own communities. Give all agencies dedicated to the service of helping and healing people the freedom to do their good works for the support of all people. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Hear also now our prayers for all who are sick or hospitalized, the injured and the lonely, especially Judy Coletti, Joe Dorfner, Gloria Fabian, Marlene Laramie, Art Lutheris, Amy Morgan, Chuck Ogletree, Jeff Shakatano, and Robin Telly. Lord, we also ask that you would be, be with the family and friends of those who are now with you in heaven, including Dan Strelchek, father of June Pedersen, who passed away earlier this week, and also Kathy Flynn, who passed away earlier this week, whose service is later on today at Emmanuel, visitation from four to six, and the service then at six. Lord, we also pray for the family and friends of Hugh Heiss, brother of Chuck, who passed away this week as well. Lord, give your abiding comfort in every circumstance that in Jesus Christ we shall not die, but live and declare his works. Grant that your healing love would be administered faithfully by all medical professionals and those who supply the needy in any way. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And so into your hands, O Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy, through your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with his favor and give you peace. Amen. You know, the Treasury Department teaches the FBI and bank tellers and retailers all across the country how to spot counterfeit money. And it's not by studying what is fake, but by handling authentic bills repeatedly. You know what? It's also the best way to be able to spot counterfeit Christianity or wolves in sheep's clothing by simply being in God's word in handling what is authentic truth on a daily basis. I pray you will do just that. So don't trust this necessarily, but always 
Trust this all the way to heaven. Have a great week.